The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents International Focus, a weekly discussion of the people and events behind today's global headlines. Support provided by Milwaukee Public Television and the UWM Center for International Education. Now here's your host, Rob Rasigliano. Welcome to International Focus. Today's topic, 21st century national security. Throughout much of the 20th century, challenges to U.S. security were seen largely through the lens of external threats presented by ideologically driven enemies. The Cold War provided policymakers with a seemingly clear sense of where American interests lay. But as globalization erases the line between things domestic and external, many analysts are reframing the concept of national security in more expansive terms. Our guest today provided just such an analysis in his role as, strategic, as Special Strategic Assistant to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Colonel Mark Mickleby is a co-author of the groundbreaking Mr. Y Report that has been described as a strategic blueprint for understanding and reacting to the changes of the 21st century world. Colonel Mickleby retired from the Marine Corps in July 2011. He has since joined LRN, a consulting firm operating in over 120 nations. He also serves as a senior fellow with the New America Foundation's Smart Security Initiative. Colonel Mickleby, welcome to the International Focus. Thanks, Rob. So I have to put you on notice, you know, the, the title, Mr. the Mr. Y Report, you know, harkens to the Mr. X uh, uh, paper written by native Milwaukee and George F. Kennan. So you, you, you're taking on a big subject here. And I'm, I, it, when Kennan wrote the Mr. X piece, it was at a time when the U.S. needed a new paradigm to guide its national security strategies, foreign policy. Does the title Mr. Y suggest we're at another of those times when we need a new paradigm? Uh, well, first I got to go uh, uh, on record and say we didn't, Wayne and I, uh, Wayne Porter, the uh, Navy Captain Wayne Porter, who wrote the, uh, we co-authored the uh, article or the National Strategic Narrative uh, with, uh, we didn't name it Mr. Y. <laughs> that was something that was given to us, so uh, I wouldn't, uh, that, that's too hubris laden. You were volunteered to, in the military We were volunteered in that, in, in that sense. but. Uh, uh, to, but to your point about is it time for a new paradigm, uh, clearly we think so. We think uh, that the information age and the, the age of globalization is just as ep uh, an epical shift in uh, human history as that of uh, the agricultural revolution or the industrial revolution, and that it's time that we reframe our approach, uh, particularly in a 21st century context. So uh, it's not to say that we, uh, where we have come from, uh, in terms of the constructs uh, or the concept of containment were wrong. It was, uh, pro it was probably the right thing at the right time for a nation, uh, but it's a new world and, uh, and it's a new age and we need to reframe ourselves uh, to the challenges and also more importantly, uh, put ourselves in a position to pursue and uh, obtain the opportunities that are resident out in that 21st century environment. It's been, it's been, uh, I remember back into the, the first George Bush administration when uh, the, the, the Berlin Wall was down and, and the, 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 the administration and subsequent administrations kind of embarked on the, the task of what, what, what's our new touchstone? What's our new reference point here? Um, uh, can you talk to us about why it has been so difficult for administrations to find that and, and, and how are we doing? I mean, have we found that touchstone? Right. I, uh, I'll just get, you know, my opinion is, uh, my opinion only is that uh, we have confused a touchstone with an uh, enemy or a threat. That, uh, I mean, it was, wasn't lost on uh, either Wayne or I while we were talking about grand strategy. Uh, and uh, a lot of folks in D.C. always want to know, okay, well, who's the enemy? Well, you know, it's not China, it wasn't Iran. We, we never thought that you had to have an enemy to have a grand strategy. We just thought you needed to have interests. And so uh, I think that is the biggest uh, uh, jump, cognitive leap we have to make is to recognize that we don't have to have an enemy to have a strategy. We just have to recognize, uh, to use uh, uh, a phrase of Lincoln, is you know where we are and whither we are attending, and we could better uh, judge uh, what to do and how to do it. We have to look at where we are currently right now and where do we want to go. And right now, there isn't a big enemy out there. And I know, understand about uh, Al-Qaeda Al uh, and uh, some of the uh, uh, 
uh, the threats that we face, but we can't allow those threats to define us as America. Uh, we are the land of opportunity. We're not the land of threat and risk. We ought to be start, start framing out how we're going to approach opportunities in the 21st century uh, and not try to just strictly limit our, uh, our efforts towards addressing threats and risk. Well, now there's someone, it's somewhat understandable why people will think about, uh, I mean, some, some risk sometimes grabs the attention more than even opportunity does. Um, how, what's our ability to, I mean, you've been on the inside, you've been with the Joint Chiefs, you've been, you've been out of the uh, active uh, Marine Corps for a while. Um, how are we going to, can we make this shift? I mean, can, can we not be defined by, by risks and, and, and move more toward exploiting opportunity? Well, I, I think we can. I mean, I, I clearly think we can. And I don't buy, first of all, I don't buy off on the, uh, on the, I do not buy off on the storyline that America is an empire in decline. I mean, I just don't buy it. And I don't think Americans will accept that. I do think, though, that uh, we have become uh, complacent as citizens. I think that, uh, in a speak, you know, speaking directly about American citizens, we're not acting as citizens, we're acting as residents. We pay rent and we expect services to come back to us. Uh, we have a certain sense of entitlement. Well, a citizen doesn't have a sense of entitlement, they have a sense of destiny and responsibility. And I think we have to refine and recalibrate what it means to be a citizen in the United States and recognize that we gotta put a little bit of sweat equity into the game and that there's no amount of outsourcing our national security because national security, you know, to the military in particular, because national security in the 21st century context is not strictly an issue of defense anymore. There's an immense array, systemic array of uh, things coming together. Uh, it's food and water and climate and energy and education, the built environment. All these things have to come together as a systemic whole so we can build our strength as a nation, uh, so we can have the credibility and influence abroad uh, so that we can pursue our enduring interests of uh, uh, prosperity and security. Uh, and that, those are the two big interests, enduring interests that Wayne and I focused in on. But we also said that we have to be able to pursue those interests uh, in a values-based way, values as they are articulated uh, within the Constitution, most, uh, most specifically within the preamble of the Constitution. That's our, that's our approach, and that means that we have to look inward. This isn't about isolationism, but we have to put a big mirror in our face and say, okay, do we, are we really about threat and risk to preserve a status quo, or are we the bold innovators, entrepreneurs that the world has come to expect and that we are going to uh, seek those new opportunities in the 21st century and show the world uh, a way forward uh, that is not only uh, consistent with our values as a nation, but is also sustainable over the long run. Because right now on a global scale, we are not, as a human species, we are not uh, acting in a very sustainable way. Well, I want to I, I want to come back to the the issue of what is it, what it is that we as citizens can do because I th I want to I want to save that for later because because I want to focus in more on the really the heart of of what you're, you're you're talking about, which is this redefinition away from strictly the the sort of kinetic the physical mm -hmm. defense oriented aspect of security to a, a very multifaceted. Uh, approach that like water, food, environmental sustainability, and so on. Um, clearly, um, I, ca I can imagine the the pushback you get on that, both you know in in uh, in in public sort of fora as well as perhaps in policy making circles in in, in in DC. And and I'm guessing one of the top of the list is, but come on, they're bad guys out there, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I can't talk about opportunity and 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 um, social. Uh, problems in, in entrepreneurship and innovation if someone's trying to kill me. Right. Uh, and, and nowhere did we ever say that we didn't need to take on bad guys. Uh, you know, that's why God made Marines, because we're supposed to go out and headbutt people. You know, so I mean, that's, uh, you know, that, bad guys are there. We need to have a strong, technologically advanced, uh, professional military to go deal with these things. But it cannot be uh, we can't leave with our military chin. I mean, we have to recognize what that, what kind of face that puts on America if everything we do is focused on threats and risks. Uh, yes, we gotta take care of them, that's a reality. And uh, we've got the military to do that. But uh, we have to recognize that we can't let threats and risks define us as a people. We're the land of opportunity. Now those are, that's a big arm wave, big uh, fly, uh, you know, kind of flowery statement that uh, tended to tug at the heartstrings. But you know what? Amer uh, the rest of the world is going to stop believing that we're the land of opportunity because of how we act. We don't seem to be pursuing opportunities. Uh, we, right now we have 4% of the world's population. We consume 25% of the world's resources. 
Uh, it sure looks like we are more intended than keeping our position, our sta the status quo, keeping our position in the world at the expense of others. When there's a far more efficacious way forward, a way that's consistent with our values as a nation, we can show the world a different way forward. Uh, and it would definitely put us in a position of leadership, and, but not leadership in, from a position of paternalism. Uh, it definitely put us in a place of leadership as a partnership uh, and create this, you know, we talk about in, our, in the narrative that competition isn't, shouldn't be a win-lose situation. It can be a win-win situation. And uh, not to get overly verbose about it, but it's an important concept to recognize that the original concept of competition, competitor, the root stem of it is competari. It comes from Latin and it means to strive together. It doesn't mean trip the guy running next to you, kick him in the head and skip across the finish line. <laughs> so maybe we need to re define what it means to be a good, solid competitor. In the process of being the best America we can be, we can help others be their best competitor, uh, the best competitor as well, and we all uh, benefit from that, uh, that relationship. We have a, a few minutes before a break, and uh, I want to continue the discussion after the break. <clears throat> but it, 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 it's been begin to, uh, beginning to appreciate that as you view the world and you, you view the, the need for this kind of a perspective, it's maybe based in part on, on the impact you think it will have outside the United States. So, so in other words, if I'm in that traditional defense mode, I'm thinking, I understand force that keeps you, prevents you from, you bad guy from doing something. How does um, this leadership uh, role, the, 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 say, say we take leadership on environmental stewardship, how, what does that do for us? I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, by us acting that way, not by proselytizing any kind of concepts or uh, what everyone else should be doing. We have to show it. It's how we act that, uh, that's going to matter. Uh, it's how we do the things here in the United States that's going to matter. This has the strongest voice abroad. And uh, this isn't a new idea. I mean, this is, uh, you know, George Kedden was quite the visionary, quite prescient. There's an interesting little uh, known book, uh, and it's actually a collection of his lectures when he was in Princeton in 1954 called Realities of American Foreign Policy. In chapter four of that, it's called The Unifying Factor. And I, longest, it's page 112 through 114 if anybody <laughs> wants to look it up. The longest paragraph you're ever going to read, but he talks to, directly to what your question is. And he says, nobody, uh, we know, he says, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, that nobody is going to follow somebody that they don't recognize as acting, you know, that, that, that they don't respect. Uh, and and uh, he puts that in the context of domestic and foreign policy that he said nobody's going to be willing to follow an America that is uh, drifting in its internal development and drifting in bad and dangerous waters were his terms. He said the way we live our lives in America, how we are and how we approach our challenges going in the 21st century is going to define our relationships with those abroad. That people are going to look at what we do, not what we say. And that's why Wayne and I talk in the narrative about we've got to close our say-do gap. We, there's no free lunch. It's hard work. It is putting skin in the game. And you, you know this as being a parent, that you can't, tell, you, can't, you can't do one thing and then tell your kids to do something else and expect those, lessons, those life lessons to stick. I mean, this is just basic human one-on-one -on -one dynamics. So, uh, and believe it or not, national foreign policy and domestic policy, it's a human endeavor. So maybe those little rules of doing what you, uh, doing what you say uh, ring true not only in your own house, but also on the international scene. Well, we'll talk more about some of the things we should be doing, uh, in, right. in addition to saying. Right. Uh, after our break, we'll be back in just a moment on International Focus. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back to International Focus. We're talking about 21st century national security with Colonel Mark Mickleby. Uh, uh, Mark, well, before the break, we were talking about some of the, some of the things that, that we can be doing here um, that will serve us, uh, uh, make us more influential and more secure in the world. You mentioned in, in the report a few priority areas that, that we should really be focus, focusing on. I wonder if you could take us through what some of those are and how they will, will pay off for us. Sure. Uh, I'll just list them off, and then we can uh, talk as much as you, you want about them. But uh, we had three 
uh, strategic priorities. I mean, we're talking about national grand strategic priorities. Number one is education. We've got to start educating our kids uh, so that they can be the best competitors, the best entrepreneurs, the best innovators in a 21st century. Second thing uh, that our uh, strategic priority was national security, but national security more broadly defined than just national defense. The national security just isn't an issue of our shores outward, that we've got to start looking at the vibrancy, the health of our internal systems and how those systems relate uh, to the rest of the world. And again, talking about food, water, transportation, the built environment, uh, uh, all the systems that come together uh, that uh, constitute our society as we know it today. And then the third uh, aspect, the third priority uh, uh, in our view was the access to and the cultivation of uh, renewable resources, in particular energy. There's a whole new uh, energy economy out there and we're asleep at the switch uh, for some strange reason, mostly ideological, and it's insane. Um, we have to recognize that the age of fossil fuels is over. And uh, I know that will cause a lot of lather with a lot of people, but there's, pl uh, there's enormous opportunity here that, uh, that we should be pursuing. Uh, and uh, it's just, a, it is so lucrative, uh, it's an absolute mistake to, just to turn our backs on it for no other reason than we just don't want to do it. What are the, if we look again, if we look at the, the, the impact we want to have on, on others abroad, if they see, um, well, the, the education pays off both because it, it helps us be competitive and engage effectively in the world and a, and a whole range of, of endeavors. Um, uh, is part of what you're, you're also saying, though, that, that uh, this is a concern not just here, but it's a concern around the world? And, and if we are leaders in that space, in, in education, that it's, it's something that gives us. It's exportable. It's something that gives us influence abroad. It's, uh, yeah, it's exportable. It's also, uh, again, we have plenty of folks from abroad that want to come and get into our university system, and that's in, and that's that's great. Uh, and I think we should continue to do that. Uh, but it, it is definitely exportable in the form of how our uh, Americans will conduct themselves. Uh, uh, both in interpersonal relationships and in professional relationships. I think uh, you know we've we've got a top notch uh, higher education system we've really you know there we can argue about the data on that but i think really what we've got to start focusing in on is elementary education uh, uh, then you know up through high school also vocational uh, education because advanced uh, advanced degrees are not the only thing that uh, i mean we need to have some you know sound vocational tech, uh, technologically oriented uh, uh, opportunities for for kids uh, and I mean, I believe that Michael uh, Mandelbaum and uh, Tom Friedman say that the, the, the skill sets that we have to start teaching our kids is how to create their own jobs. That means that, uh, in, in my opinion, that uh, it goes beyond just uh, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, which is absolutely critical, uh, those uh, technology-based uh, uh, aspects of education. Uh, but we have to start uh, incorporating uh, what uh, David Orr, uh, 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 the term he, uh, he coined, echo-literacy. I mean, the, uh, the systemic connection of, how we, uh, of our systems to a, a larger ecology, beyond just, uh, you know, the... the, the you know, the environment, which is a huge part, but also that we have these uh, human systems that are developing over time. We have to understand your place in it, how you're connected to it, and that you've got a moral responsibility. That's more of a philosophical, humanities-based uh, education, but there's also science involved in that as well. Uh, and then I would also add in entrepreneurship. We need to start teaching entrepreneurship to our kids because that's how you see opportunity. You recognize risk and threat, but you also are more oriented towards the opportunity and what you can make of that. That is classic America. Uh, and that's, uh, it doesn't just happen by accident. We've got to invest in that. Uh, in the long run, uh, education system, just to get a little bit flowery on you here, it's not all about technology. Technology, remember, is techno, skill, logos, knowledge, or skill of knowledge. We've got to have a philosophy, a philo, wisdom, a love of wisdom to inform that technology. Because without that wisdom to inform the technology, we're lost. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I want to, I want to, um, uh, I guess, play a little bit of advocate about uh, how this, how, how, I mean, you're just from a, like, if I were advising you, for, if I were advising the military or the defense community from as a, as a strategist, I'd say, hey, you know, you're, you're talking about opening up the whole security field now to a whole bunch of other players. Whereas you just have a, I mean, when people said, hey, let's talk about security and you're with all the interagency, everybody would turn to the defense department and say, okay, yeah, what do we do? 
you're saying, hey, we, we need to kind of explode that a little bit. What I'm saying is that we got to stop just talking about security. We need to talk about prosperity and security. Uh, I, I'll give you a little quote from Lewis Mumford in you know, uh, The Condition of Man. He was describing the uh, uh, Rome, the decline of Rome. That everybody sought security, but nobody accepted responsibility. So Rome pushed the legions out, tried to keep all the bad things away. They used to have this thing, uh, a little quip called, you know, they'd say, Hannibal ante portas, Hannibal's at the door. And so they built those structures, pushed everything out. Meanwhile, they were rotting from within. Well, uh, Hannibal came knocking, although, although it wasn't his name. Uh, Alaric came knocking in about 415 AD, and he had a bunch of smelly, stinking Visigoth pals with him. They kicked the door of Rome in, and they sacked the place. Uh, preserving the status quo isn't the way to go. And they all sought security, security, but nobody accepted responsibility. And they recognized that security starts at home with how we act and the vibrancy of our system and our, the, the commitment of citizens to community and to society and to their nation. Uh, there is no free lunch. And it uh, doesn't matter how much taxes you pay. It's the skin that you put into the game, the sweat equity you put in to the game that's going to count. So to, uh, that was a meandering way uh, to get to your question. But it's not about opening up the halls of security uh, to all these different things and a mess. It, it would be a mess if we <laughs> maintain the structures that we have now. That's why when I said we have to start uh, anew. We had a National Security Act in 1947, uh, which is pretty much constitutes the system we have now. We uh, opine that we should have a National Prosperity and Security Act, something new to get into U.S. code, uh, to create the new types of authorities and relationships between the public, private, and civil sector so we can leverage our resources and preserve uh, the essence of our republic uh, as it was articulated in the, 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 the founding fathers' uh, prime documents. I know that some of your work with the New American Foundation and the Smart Security Initiative has been working on, so how do we take this, this new narrative, this new national security narrative, narrative and translate it into action? So, so how, is this, are these some of the directions that you've yeah, taken it? Yeah, And I would just say, again, with the, it's, we were very careful with the language. It was a national strategic narrative because we didn't want to be put in yeah. that bin of national security right. as it's currently defined because it's the, the definition is... Uh, is uh, misplaced as, with our current context. But to answer your question, yes. I mean, we, uh, uh, this is just my affiliation with the uh, New America Foundation, uh, particularly now that I'm re uh, retired. We're actually trying to provide the so what story to, or the so what of uh, the national strategic narrative. So if we have this concept, if we can move from containment, a strategy of containment to a strategy of sustainability, what would that look like? I mean, uh, you, you got eventually you got to stop talking with big arm waves and you got to get down to the doing. So. We uh, think we've come up with a pretty good idea of how to frame out the strategy. Bottom line is the way America does grant strategy, the way we've done it uh, historically well, has been an econo uh, had an economic base, whether it was the arsenal of democracy, whether it was containment. These were all leveraged off the strength and vibrancy of our economy. Nobody knew that better than General Eisenhower, uh, the president. And that's, a, you know, that's a, a, just a great success story of a, of a man that understood what it was going to take. Uh, for us, uh, we think uh, the main uh, foundation for a grand strategy is going to be based on the economy, and we think there's three main pillars to that. One, smart growth, uh, loaded words because a lot of people recoil back from it because it's become almost cliche, but I'll explain that in a second. The second thing is regenerative agriculture. Uh, we have got to get to a place where we can feed our, uh, not only feed our nation, but really feed the world. And the current system we have uh, is not sustainable. Iowa's already lost 50% of its topsoil. Uh, one third of our nation is clinically obese because of the type of food uh, that uh, we eat. It ca costs 10 to 14 calories of petroleum energy to get one calorie of food in our belly. That's an unsustainable system. And then the third uh, pillar is uh, a tax shift, where we move taxes away from productivity to, uh, to waste and consumption. Uh, and uh, our initial framework, uh, laying those things out with smart growth, uh, I just want to uh, point to this uh, little stat. Huge economic opportunity. According to the National Re uh, Realtors Association, 56% of Americans are not satisfied with where they live and they seek the attributes of smart growth. Talking about service rich, mixed use, mixed income, higher density, transit oriented types of living environments. Uh, not only does that um, uh, mean uh, less uh, traffic and et cetera, but it's a huge uh, uh, 
positive gain in terms of public health. And just reference uh, uh, Dr. Dick Jackson's work at UCLA, uh, specifically about the, the, the framework or the type of built environment we have to public health. The, the numbers are, are, are astounding. But the most important thing is that this is a unique moment in history, just like we had with returning GIs from after World War II, uh, GI Bill, and uh, we started uh, cat, uh, the catalyst for uh, suburb, uh, suburbia. Right thing to do at the time, it fueled, it was an economic engine that fueled uh, our economy. We have the same type of demographic uh, trends or shifts occurring right now. 56% of Americans don't like where they live. They seek the attributes of smart growth, 56%, but only 2% of the housing market will satisfy their needs. That's a huge economic opportunity that we can get $3.6 trillion of capital sitting on the fence right now, working for America. We're just, just about out of time. We've got just uh, 30 seconds left. And I, I, I wanted to come back to, so what, if we open this discussion up to prosperity, and security. It, it, it creates a space for individuals to get involved in a way they haven't been involved before. In their own community. How, how do they, so so how would they, how, what's your one piece, best piece of advice for them as to how to do that? Best piece of advice is uh, don't wait for anybody to tell you what to do. This is uh, democracy in America. De Tocqueville had it right. Americans get off their rumps and they take, get it on in their own community. So look for the opportunities. There's opportunities to engage in your uh, local schools. Opportunity to start looking for the attributes of uh, smart growth. Start voting in terms of regard. I want more tr uh, uh, transportation options. Not just my car. I mean, these are all things that you can just start doing in your own uh, communities just by voicing your concerns. Great. Colonel Mark Michael B., thank you very much thank for, you. for helping us understand 21st century security. To our viewers, International Focus, we'll see you next week. For information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220 or visit us at our website.